Okay, so welcome everyone to our eighth obliquity session, um, Art and Dermatology. I'm really excited to be joined by Jade. Um, we actually know each other from undergrad. We were lab partners in organic chemistry. And so it's really cool for us to share this new space together. Um, she is a fourth year medical student in the, doing her medical school um, in the States right now, actually. And she's applying into dermatology and is gracious enough to have done this um, presentation during her interview period. So thank you so much. And I will hand it over to you. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Jade. Um, I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, Manisha, yeah, Manisha and I met in um, organic chemistry years ago. I'm so glad that we sat next to each other in organic chemistry um, and we were lab partners. So it's really um, great that we are um, both like going to be doctors in a couple of months. And I just wanted to mention how proud I am of you and um, how proud I am of you that, you're, that you created this and um, that you're doing all the things that you're doing. Um, okay, so let me try to go into presenter mode. So, okay, thank you so much everyone for um, attending this talk. Um, it's going to be on art and dermatology and just sort of, I think like my open interpretation of it and it's going to be very interactive and I hope that um, we can all sort of discuss together um, and uh, yeah, just have an open discussion. You, I don't expect everyone to like kind of turn their cameras on, but I hope we can just kind of have an open dialogue. <laughs> okay, so here's the agenda. It's going to be um, a discussion on art and dermatology, first of all, and then um, we're going to do a bit of observation exercises, and then we're going to be discussing the Fitzpatrick skin type scale and um, inclusivity in dermatology as a whole. Um, and so before we get started, I actually wanted to do our land acknowledgement. So um, I wanted to acknowledge that we are on, um, I'm calling from New York City, which is um, now politically designated as New York City. However, it's um, the homeland of the Lenape people. Um, and I also grew up on Treaty 7 territory, which is now politically designated as Calgary, Alberta. So um, I hope that wherever you're calling in from, you could just take a moment to um, acknowledge uh, the land that you're uh, calling in from. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I used to be more artistically inclined. These are just a few drawings from when I was younger. Um, not saying that they're any good, but I'm just saying that I used to be a little bit more artistically inclined. Um, I used to enjoy sketches with charcoal, just with pencils um, on sketches on sketchbooks and um, one thing that I always say is I feel like I sort of sacrificed my um, creative side for my academic pursuits especially as someone who pursued um, medical school <laughs> um, and I, I kind of that kind of always made me sad but um what I learned when I went into medical school and actually once I pursued dermatology and had the opportunity to, to participate in a research year and um, be mentored by amazing mentors and, um, and spearhead some personal research projects, um, I found that I could actually tap back into my um, creative side and, um, and realize that that part of me was never actually sacrificed. It was just a little bit suppressed and I could um, re-nurture it again. So I just wanted to um, share this and, and share with anybody who maybe um, feels a similar way that um, <laughs> there's still hope for us. And actually the two, art and medicine, um, go very much hand in hand. So this is, I'm just sharing a little bit about some of the art in medicine that I've done personally. So um, here's a, a, a drawing that I made for um, a research project actually. On the left here is a, a, a promotional drawing that I made for a Black Girl Magic survey that I was doing for um, just looking at the, uh, the impact of empowerment movements online on people who identified as black women on social media. 
um, and seeing the impact that that had on their personal um, perception of their Afrocentric features, especially um, in, in like juxtaposition with the Eurocentric beauty standards of society today and in mainstream media. So this was like um, a, a, a sketch I made and we put it out on Instagram and we reached um, a whole bunch of participants and we got a whole bunch of responses. So I was, I was personally really proud of it and I was super glad that I got to do that, especially as someone who used to love to draw. And then here's something I did on the right. Um, I modeled it after um, an image of um, hair types I had seen online, but I wanted to highlight um, it on uh, skin of color and hair of color. And so it just shows um, that different hair textures ranging from types one to type 4C. Um, and then here are some images that were published in journals. Um, and I just wanted to highlight these again because um, these were all done during my research year. And I believe these are all actually in one publication. Um, me and my mentor, Dr. Jillian Richmond, did a graphical review on the amino pathogenesis of alopecia areata. And um, I got to personally do um, a bunch of illustrations highlighting the different clinical variants of alopecia areata and also the immunopathogenesis of um, alopecia areata and this disease process, but also the normal um, hair growth cycle. So there's some examples. Okay, so art and dermatology. I wanted to share this quote from a paper that I really like um, called Integrating the Integumentary System with the Arts, a review of dermatologic findings in artwork. And it's by, um, and I don't have my notes with, I can't view my notes, but it's the, I can't, so I don't remember the first names of the artists or of the, um, of the authors, but their last names are um. Um, okay, so the, the quote is, the breadth of examples of dermatology represented in art suggests that portraits might serve as an unintentional atlas of dermatologic conditions. By implication, it seems that the arts might be more interconnected to the sciences than traditionally acknowledged. So I really like this quote because I think, I think when we think of dermatology, we don't necessarily think of art we we don't necessarily think of art we don't necessarily think of art when we think of medicine um however we think more of like the sciences however we we don't consciously think of the fact that they are intrinsically intertwined um but when you look back at art and art history and just how people were depicted people's skin were was also depicted like people were not depicted without their skin or without their hair. And um, it's just so interesting to me that you could look back into um, ancient uh, paintings and see de depictions of diseases that we study today. So um, I included some images that were included in this review article. And one is um, Ombre syndrome on the left, which um, is a syndrome which is basically an overgrowth of hair. And then um, on the right is a syndrome called ichthyosis hystrix, which is um, a syndrome of severe like 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 finication. So the next slide, we are going to do a little exercise. So if Anyone wants to unmute and just say what you feel from this painting and what you observe. And I guess just to kick things off, I can go first. I, oh, sorry. Oh, actually go ahead whoever was going. Thank you. Um, I would say the first thing that stood out to me was um, his skin, um, the bumps on his nose, also the age difference between him and the child that's looking up at him. Um, but I would definitely say, I don't know, maybe from a medical student apps aspect, I was, um, I had noticed um, his nose. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, me too. I that say, was. I would say the child um, is looking at the nose, but not with fear, just with interest. It, it seems comfortable with the, the grandfather or whoever it is, you know, the, where the place with the hand is placed and so on. The child seems okay there, not fearful. I agree. Thank you. I think the child being of that age and naturally curious notices the difference in say the grandfather's nose and um, yeah, is, is curious exactly what the previous person said. I agree. Um, just by looking at how the man is embracing the child, it makes me think that he may be the child's father or grandfather or somebody, uh, somebody really close. And um, just by how comfortable he appears to be, it makes me think that um, whatever's going on with his skin may not be infectious, at least to his understanding. Thank you for that. I agree with you. So I think generally like senses of like peace from this painting, um, the child seems to be at peace with this um, father figure, grandfather figure. Um, although there is disfigurement depicted on the grandfather or whoever um, on the person's nose. Does anyone know what this condition is that's depicted in this painting? Any of the dermies on the call? Is Phimidus rosacea? Yes, it is. <laughs> Who said that? I think Saka. Yeah, that was great. This is Phimidus rosacea. Um, and um, I think what strikes me about this painting is that it's from it was painted in 1490 um, and as people in medicine when we're learning about dermatology this is rosacea is one of the first um, dermatologic conditions that we learn and it's one of the subsets that we learn of rosacea so it's really interesting to me that um, this very recognizable condition is painted centuries ago and um, it, it kind of uh, highlights to me the fact that art and dermatologies just really do go hand in hand. All right, thank you so much for your um, participation and let's move on to the next painting. All right, so any initial thoughts or words that come to mind in this painting called Madeleine de la Martinique? Interesting, the choice to uh, put the woman in the in the white shirt that sort of echoes the the depictation of the child that they kind of match and belong. Absolutely. I think similarly, uh, the composition, it, it feels very natural. It's not um, that the child is, is bedridden or in a hospital. Um, he's clearly playing um, in a place that's colorful and there's the fruit around. So I think it changes it from kind of almost pathologizing this picture if the setting had been different versus um, the setting being very natural and um, homey even. I agree, Manisha. It's like a very warm atmosphere. And I'm seeing in the chat um, the topography of the land outside. Oh, this is from earlier. Um, but I, I agree with your observation, Muna, from earlier. That's actually a really profound observation. 
Um, anything else from this painting? All right, so now I'm going to ask, does anyone on the call know what this image is a depiction of from 1782? Sarah said it first in the chat, but vitiligo. There you are correct. Thank you. All right, so this, this is vitiligo. And so I will make a comment here that um, when I was searching for images that were sort of discussed in literature um, and discussed just in atlases and online that um, represented dermatologic conditions in um, ancient paintings, I did not see many images of skin color and it was really difficult to find any. So um, this was one of them, this is one of a few. So I think that brings me into like um, another subtopic, another subtopic of the conversation I hope that we can have today, tonight. <laughs> Okay, so um, now we're moving on to our next activity, which is describe a lesion. So let's take this sort of like step by step. So here we have um, a rash on the skin. Um, and first I wanna start by asking where on the body is this rash likely on someone's body? The inside of the elbow. Right. So this is on the inside of the elbow or the antecubital fossa. And how would you describe what you're seeing? Anyone? How about how about the colors that we see? Um, I would say that there's variation in colors. Um, some areas are lighter, darker than others. Um, colors wise, and I do, it does like seem like small kind of just like raised bumps. Absolutely. Small raised bumps, variation in color. How would you describe the colors? Anyone? Would you say that it's um, erythematous? Yeah, erythematous, um, red, looks like some are um, a little bit yellowish. Um, absolutely. So. And as you can see, the so this image is from Visual DX. All credit to Visual DX. Um, but the their description is still in this caption. So it says papules, papular vesicles, and erosions over the antecubital fossa. Um, and does anyone know or want to take a guess at what condition that this is describing? One hundred percent correct, Sakna. Yeah. So this is eczema or atopic dermatitis, and um, this is in light skin. So let's take a look at this next image. How would you describe this image? So let's start with um, the location of this rash. I'd say it's the same same region. Yeah, same region, antecubital fossa. Yeah. And how would you describe the rash itself? It looks like. Scalier. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I heard. I heard it looks scalier. A little bit of like, I don't know if it's lichenification or lichenification or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You're right, Christine. It's like the skin is thick and I can't if I... It's also not as erythematous as the previous picture. It looks more so hyperpigmented. Yeah, you're right, Michelle. It's not as erythematous. It's like, how would, how would you describe the colors here? How would, it, how would anyone describe the colors here? Looks silvery and gray to me. I agree. I'd say it looks, um, sorry, go ahead. It's like um, darker areas, the um, scales or crust. Yes, it looks like you can almost see where the patient was like scratching and then there's areas that have crusted over. So like some excoriated areas with crust, absolutely. So um, any thoughts um, on this diagnosis? Was it eczema? Yes, it is. So um, it's also eczema. So any thoughts on both um, conditions on both areas of the skin on different skin colors? I'm just going to flip back through a couple more times and, and ask of your thoughts regarding the, the comparisons. I think it would be hard to think it was the same condition Absolutely. if you were already educated about it. Absolutely. Um, and I just want to pose a question for anyone um, who's been through like any type of medical education. Um, when you were going through medical education or as you are going through medical education, how would you describe the proportion of the images that you see represented? Would you say that they are um, representative of all skin types or would you say that not so much? From my experience, I would say not so much at all. Um, and I've even had like experiences where like either one of my relatives or one of my friend's relatives has had a skin condition that we learned about and just seeing how it looks on different skin tones. We're just like, we're so surprised and shocked at the difference and also just really confused why that wouldn't be included in our medical education, you know, being able to identify it as well. It's just as important. Definitely agree with um, Timo. And something else that I noticed was, you know, if um, the condition was, say, tinea capitis or tinea capititis, you know that it'd be like a Black child because that's more likely in that, um, in our race. So unless it's specifically um, garnered to one racial profile, other than that, it's going to be um, a lighter skin, skin profile. I was going to say the same thing. I was trying to think back to the derm lectures that we got, and I'm I'm quite certain that Tinea was the only one that uh, um, that had any other skin color other than um, other than either Caucasian or or light, very light skin tone. Yeah. And I, I feel like I share the same experience as all of you. And actually um, there, there was studies that showed um, that images of dark skin were underrepresented throughout medical um, education, but they were actually overrepresented when there were teachings of um, sexually transmitted infections. So um, I think that that also poses a risk for 
instilling bias in medical trainees as well. So I think one, we, we all have to be very, very careful with the training that um, med medicine offers. All right. Thank you for sharing everyone. So now let's move on to the discussion of the Fitzpatrick scale. Does anyone know what the Fitzpatrick scale is? Or I guess show of hands, has anyone heard of it? You could do like the virtual raise your hand thing. <laughs> It's like so hard for me to see. Okay, thank you. Awesome. So the Fitzpatrick scale is um, it's the most popularly used um, scale of measurement for skin color in dermatology and dermatologic literature. Um, it basically classifies patients skin color into six different categories when describing their skin, especially for um, uh, describing their, especially when describing their lesions, whether that's for um, the dermatologic literature or in um, um, clinical practice. So here I've just added from Dermnet, Dermnet NZ, the um, skin types and the descriptions. So I'm just going to go through them. Um, skin type one, which is depicted here on the upper left, is described as pale white skin, blue or green eyes, blonde or red hair, and it always burns and does not tan. Skin type two, which is described as fair skin with blue eyes, burns easily and it tans poorly. Skin type three is described as darker white skin. It tans after initial burn, excuse me, and skin type four, um, which is on the bottom left, is described as light brown skin, burns minimally, and tans easily. Skin type five is described as brown skin. It rarely burns and it tans darkly easily. And skin type six is described as dark brown or black skin, and it never burns or always tans darkly. Um, and also of mention, usually in uh, the dermatologic literature, uh, skin of color is described as skin types four through six, and um, light skin is usually described as skin types one through three, or um, primarily skin types one and two. Um, there are there are sometimes gray areas, especially around skin types three and four. Um, so, the question I want to ask just. Um, initially off the bat to the uh, participants tonight is do you feel do you feel as though your skin type is represented in this scale? I think my skin type might be represented but not with the description um, blue eyes. I don't think I'm a one although I have the green eyes and I don't think I'm a, I could be a two, but I have the green eyes. So yeah, no. Yeah. So I would say that I'm a like brown skin maybe, depending on the season, <laughs> um, but I burn very easily. So I don't think that I'm in this scale at all. I agree. I think the description somewhat um, is accurate for my skin, which I classify as brown skin. But just taking a look at the pictures, um, I don't think my skin tone matches the brown skin or dark brown skin category at all. Thank you. And I'll just share, thanks, thank you all for sharing. And I'll just share that I always categorize myself, like when I'm doing research studies, um, when I've been doing research studies and I do like some analyses where I categorize for myself images into these categories, I always like have thought of myself as skin type five, 
but when I look at this image and I see what they have portrayed as skin type five, I don't think that we are the same skin type. Um, so it's, it's like really interesting to me that there are only six classifications and, um, yeah. So, I mean, I just, now my second question is what are your general thoughts on the scale? Can you remind me, because I'm trying to remember, um, what was the original utility of this scale? Because I feel like it was originally designed, if I remember correctly, to assess kind of risk for cancers and things like that, hence the kind of matching color with tanning ability. Because other than that very specific application, I don't know how useful, um, as we've kind of discussed, the scale is. I think you're right. I have to double check, but I think you're right. And I think today though, it's more just widely applied to um, everything. Like it's applied to when um, in, in clinics, when we're describing patients' lesions and we're describing patients' um, morphologies when they're presenting um, just in their general cases. And then also just in literature and case reports um, and also in case series and um, clinical trials, like it's just widely used outside of the realm of skin cancers as well. But I actually have to double check that it was formed for skin cancer, but I think you're right. And um, in the chat, Gerver, I think says, a lot of dermatologists have moved away from the scale in favor of simply white, brown, and black. And this is true. A lot of dermatologists are starting to move away from describing um, skin types using the scale. And I think, I think I'm still seeing like a majority of dermatologists and dermatologic literature sort of like falling back and using this scale um, traditionally. But I think you're right. Like it's 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 good that we're moving away from this. Um, so oh, yeah, I'm, what are your thoughts generally? Sorry, go ahead, Micah. No, you can continue. <laughs> no, no, I was actually going to pose a question. So please. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with the last comment. I feel like, um, you know, in learning dermatology and even at, as a med student, like, it's we're still learning this foundational like Fitzpatrick scale to kind of start our whole like derm knowledge thing. Um, but ultimately I feel like the scale really is a res like restricted way of learning like skin tones and you know skin types and things like that, especially with the darker skin. Um, Cause I see like maybe, so there's like four lighter skins and then two darker skins, but there can be so many more levels to all of this so yeah yes I agree with you anyone else yeah I agree I agree with that like I feel like we there's a lot of ground that's being skipped over between between like uh like five and six but it, it sort of comes back to the question of like what is this scale for like if if it's for categorizing people into level of risk for skin cancer and that's how the level of risk is distributed, then I guess that's okay. But it sounds like we use it for all sorts of things and nobody really knows what we're supposed to be using it for. So yeah, I understand it probably needs a, re a rethink. I think there's one interesting perspective where um, it can almost seem racist for non, um, for people that aren't of color to categorize skin colors in terms of brown and black. So oftentimes I've spoken to some dermatologists that found that the Fitzpatrick scale is almost like a way of describing color without seeing color, but then that actually doesn't do a service to um, communities of skin of color. Really good point. I just wanted to mention, I didn't want to miss Christine's 
a message in the chat, but uh, she said, I'm East Asian and I would categorize my skin neither as white or brown or black. So just saying that she didn't fit into any of the categories as well. Yeah, Christine brings up a great point as well. And um, also like, I think it's really, it's tough. I think it's tough to categorize skin into, into any type of numeric scale and also into any type of um, spectrum of colors as well. Um, I've seen, right, I've seen like the white, brown, black, and then I've seen, um, and I think maybe in a safer manner as well, just um, classifying by um, ethnic or racial background of a patient and allowing sort of for the interpretation of the reader in that sense. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's really difficult. And I, and I actually wanted to ask um, anyone on this call what, um, what sort of ideas one might have that maybe would be like a better alternative for these types of scales and descriptions for patient skin if, or even if we, should just move away from these descriptions altogether and if they are even necessary. And Micah asks in the chat, has anyone been asked when presenting a patient to use the scale or do most just classify ethnicity and then describe the rash as normal? So in my experience in, um, on dermatology rotations, it's been a mixed experience. Um, personally, I've been asked to, um, I've been advised to start off describing the patient's skin color, not necessarily using the scale, and then go into this, the patient's um, chief complaint. Um, and like um, dermatology rotation. Um, and then other times it's not been mentioned. So I've had a mixed experience, but I'm curious as to other people's experience on dermatology rotations. I haven't done a dermatology specific rotation, but so my exposure would have been in internal medicine or, or family medicine, but I feel like for us, the Fitzpatrick was really just something we learned in, in med school, like in preclinical. Um, and like I said, I always thought it was to assess risk for skin cancer. So um, yeah, I've never really been asked to present um, what I thought the, the scale was before presenting the, the rash or the complaint. Anyone else? So and just to close, just to round off this discussion, um, I wanted us to just um, discuss together, like what are some ways that um, as a specialty and as medicine as a whole, we could continue moving the needle to be more inclusive in dermatology. Um, and I, I wanted to kick off this discussion um, by mentioning, and I wish I had included them on the slide, but there have been um, a, a host of pioneers in this field who have been doing this work for years and for decades um, prior to sort of the, the surge in, um, in focus in this area in the last couple of years. Um, so namely, there were um, pioneers in the field, um, Dr. Um, a. Kelly, who created the Skin of Color Atlas, um, Dr. Susan Taylor, who created the first uh, Skin of Color Center in the United States, and now there are, I believe, 12 across the nation. Um, uh, Dr. Amit Pandya, who created, uh, who authored the Call to Action, I believe in 2017, um, that the American Academy of Dermatology then committed to um, uh, diversity and dermatology um, as an institution. Um, and there's just been a lot of work and 
many atlases and textbooks and publications that have been uh, committed and focused on diversifying the field and in, um, increasing representation of all um, accurate representation of all skin types um, and all skin colors in the field so that we can in turn um, improve the recognition of uh, diseases and dermatologic conditions in skin of color and in turn improve outcomes of patients with skin of color and reduce those health disparities. So I, I just kind of wanted to mention that without art, there is um, no dermatology <laughs> because dermatology is intrinsically um, a field where you are practicing art. You're practicing the art of, um, of recognizing colors and textures and patterns. Um, and also just recognition is an art in itself. And um, I, I think it's a really beautiful thing to sort of explore. And I just wanted to thank Manisha for allowing me to um, explore this. So now I just want to open it up to um, all of you for any questions or comments or discussion points on this um, topic of how we can continue to improve um, inclusivity in dermatology. Well, first, I want to start off by saying you did an amazing, amazing job. This is such a cool topic, and I'm glad to have been here and seen this amazing presentation. Um, I feel like it really starts off with just, number one, creating like a culturally competent physician. And I feel like that just stems from your medical education. So um, trying to not change the curriculum, but um, just be more inclusive, I guess, in, with different skin types. And, you know, even, you know, in medical school, we learn the psoriasis, you know, eczema, things like that, but showing it in different skin tones, um, I think will, would be a great start um, and kind of showing or not showing, but, um, telling people that, you know, skin cancer can happen in everybody. So just because a darker person has, you know, a darker person, you wouldn't think they have skin cancer, they still need to be checked and things like that. So I guess it just starts with increasing the knowledge base of um, future physicians is a good way to start, I think. Thank you, Micah. And I absolutely agree. I think like I think medical school is really that foundation. And I think it's such a missed opportunity if we're not making sure that the medical school lectures are, um, are complete and um, inclusive. I think you're absolutely right. That got me thinking as well. I'm, uh, I'm interested in PEDS and I was just thinking about how um, there's so many resources for parents and new families online, especially related to pediatric rashes. And again, in those cases, I think they're again displayed on lighter skin. And I don't know if you're aware of any resources. I think that that could also be a really great opportunity for patients um, to also be educated and have these resources accessible when for example, a young child develops a rash that might not look like anything that the family can find on Google or that maybe um, any of their family or friends may have not seen before. So I think that that could be the other side of um, the points that Mika um, brought up in terms of kind of bridging both the physician knowledge as well as the access to resources of, um, of the individuals who will have these, have these rashes and skin conditions. You bring up a great point. Um, and so one resource I, I do want to mention um, is actually one that I'm on the, um, I'm a co-chair for the student advisory board for an application, like a clinical decision support application called Visual DX. Um, and that is, um, it's like a, a, a digital database of a whole host of um, images of dermatologic conditions. And that's actually where I got some of these images from. And the difference between them and other 
um, images and especially Google images is that they actually have representation of skin of color. They actually have the highest representation of skin of color in it. So I think almost a third of their images are skin of color. The only thing is that institutions need subscription to that service in order for um, like residents and attendings to be able to like um, um, access the app when they're researching what their patient might have, access the app when they want to like download a patient handout and add a picture of what their patient has and print it out for their patient. But like just anecdotally, I've been in um, clinics where the resident or the attending I'm working with has access to Visual DX and they print out a patient handout that um, has an image for like a black patient that shows exactly the type of um, condition they have on the skin type that they have. And like, you need to see the look on the patient's face when they recognize that um, they're actually represented in whatever they're looking at. So I just wish that these types of, um, this type of representation was more widespread and more accessible as well. And maybe one day we can move to like, um, move away from, um, subscription-based sorts of resources. Any closing questions or comments? I just want to thank everyone so much for your attention and your time. I know like the beginning of the year is a really busy time for everyone. So I appreciate um, your time this evening and wish me luck. I'm in the thick of my residency interviews right now. So this was a really nice like um, break for me. And it was really exciting for me to like talk about art and dermatology and sort of step outside of my comfort zone because I've never talked about this before. So thank you again, Manisha and Obliquity uh, for the opportunity. And thanks again to all of you for, uh, for your attention tonight.